and spend what I call 90-10 rule. 90% of every trader's time and effort ought to be spent studying, researching, observing, not trading. What's up traders, what's going on? Welcome back to another trader interview. This week we are sitting down with Scott Andrews. Scott is a mostly businessman who made his fortune in the 2000s and before in the uh, dot-com bubble, but lost everything and had to build this up back again with trading. It's a really good story to hear and Scott is someone that I highly respect for everything he had to go through to be able to make his living trading full-time. He in this interview we talked a lot about things that he went through in his journey, including trading for investors, having a big fund and also things that are more tactical about how to deal with losing streaks and how to change your risk and manage your exposure into drawdowns. So this is really interesting, it's something I learned a lot in this interview for sure. I'm sure you will get a lot of advice out of it. So without further ado, let's dive in right to the interview. Scott, tell me about what you do when and who you are. A bit of background about yourself. Yeah, so um, I've been around a while. I'm a little older than you, it appears. I have a little bit more gray hair, a little bit less hair. Um, I was fortunate to take a um, co-found a technology company. We're a cloud-based software as a service company and took it public back in the dot-com boom about 20 years ago. Um, I had a front row seat to the what volatility can do to the markets. That was during the dot-com boom and bust days. So uh, I was both on the receiving end, the good end of volatility is that we had this massive bubble and uh, on the um, the downside as well, I saw that bubble burst and watched my own net worth uh, collapse. Uh, but we did okay. I was forced and our company survived. Um, and um, I left maybe three or four years after that and um, really didn't trust the stock market in terms of uh, buy and hold because I had just been through the NASDAQ crashing, what did it, um, what, 70%, I think, from peak to trough roughly. Um, so, so did my net worth. So that was, uh, that was stinging uh, and it made a big impact on me. I um, went looking for strategies that, or investment strategies basically that would take advantage of volatility while avoiding the downside of volatility. I figured it couldn't be that hard to time the markets um, or, and find people that could do that. I did not really find anything that uh, met my criteria. Um, and I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was still a fairly young person. I was in my mid thirties and uh, decided I would start dabbling around with um, trading. Recruited, um, started swing trading first actually, trying to learn how to time the markets. Uh, I hired a mentor, if you will, spent a lot of money with a world-class options trader and he truly was. And after about a year of, actually about 15 months, cause I actually made money my first year, um, which in retrospect was random good luck. If you go look at the charts in 2003, it was a very big bull year. It was after the markets had recovered. We put in a bit of a V bottom. And uh, I confused my success with um, simply having a strategy that was a conservative bullish strategy, buying covered calls in a raging bull market. Uh, I felt like a genius. <laughs> But um, the market slowed down 2004. I, of course, leveraged up, gave back most of my gains in that, that I just made in the first year. I made six figures on a, a, a small account my first year trading options. Uh, so, of course, I leveraged up, gave back most of that. Um, that hurt. That was a punch in the face, punch in the gut, because uh, I just told my wife about you know what a great trader I was. And within 10 weeks, I'd given back most of it. Um, I was very lucky in that I had made money the first year because I wouldn't be here if I had. Basically, I don't know, I'll try to pick up the pace a little bit. Basically, I quickly realized that uh, swing trading didn't really work for me. And especially, um, it really wasn't the swing trading. It was the, the style of trading. I was a, learning how to interpret charts, multi-time frame analysis, classic technical analysis. And um, I found it too subjective for um, what I thought the way it needed to work. I'm a math guy. I, I couldn't understand enough about what was the expected average gain, what was expected average loss. Uh, I couldn't get, get an expectancy in my mind of any given trade, so I couldn't position size. I just couldn't get my head around how to take advantage of trading, chart-based trading. And um, it felt like it was gonna take me years and years and years to master the art of trading. And I was not interested in staring at charts every day. I didn't want another job. Um, I didn't have years to learn how to interpret charts for all these different regimes and in market conditions and environments. So 
Uh, I, I, bottom line is I threw it all away. I took $20,000 of education that I just spent 15 months on and threw it away, not out of frustration, but mostly out of self-reflection of, I, you know, I was fortunate. I was break even basically after 15 months, but, and I'd learned that it, what, that style wasn't going to work for me. So I sort of doubled down and made a bet on myself. I'm not risk averse. I'm an ex-military guy, flew helicopters. Uh, I've done some pretty cool things in my life. Um, so I don't mind risk. And I had a little bit of time and money, but I started focusing on um, just analyzing data. I literally downloaded daily um, chart data from uh, Yahoo Finance. So looking at what the Dow had done and what the S&P had done on given days. And I started looking for patterns, mining data to try to find situations where a directional bias existed. I ended up um, stumbling on some things. I hired one of my original developers from my first company. And we built, uh, he helped me build a portfolio of rules-based signals that would spit out a trade about twice a week, but they were day trades. So I would literally get in in the open and um, exit at some predetermined target, but no later than the end of the day. So I essentially built the strategy that I was looking for when I left the corporate world, which was something that could take advantage of volatility because, you know, day trading um, does a great job of that while not having the overnight risk um, during bear markets. So that's sort of how I got into it. Um, and just to quickly summarize, I, uh, I traded discretionarily with these rules-based signals for about seven years, developed, a, started a blog, uh, then I started, added a PayPal button, I started, turned it into a real business. Actually, I had a big following called, um, the company was called Master the Gap, uh, meaning like the opening gap. I know they don't exist really in uh, Forex, which a lot of your listeners uh, trade, but I was trading futures at the time and uh, they don't really exist in futures either, but I would use the low volume activity I would essentially ignore in the overnight session. And I would treat the difference between the prior day close and the next morning's open here on the East Coast um, as a gap. So I set up my charts to set up an artificial gap, a synthetic gap, if you will. Um, had a lot of success uh, 2008, 2009, because uh, the volatility exploded with the financial crisis. I'd never traded a bear market. Remember, I, I suffered as a uh, technology CEO, watched my stock uh, and market, um, my net worth collapse, but I'd never traded it. I'd only traded pretty much 2003 through 2007, 2008, which had been a bullish rise in the market. Uh, and that was a pretty good time to um, trade. So I had no choice and I just started the blog and uh, my service had no choice, but to sort of stick with my system. And what I did was I built a portfolio of signals that uh, there were two that were raging bull market kind of strategies. Uh, there were two that were sort of neutral strategies, sort of sideways markets. And the one that would, should, should in theory do well in a bear market. So I had a diversified mini portfolio of day trading signals. And um, I was very fortunate the, they worked. Um, the bull market strategies didn't trade as much uh, because it was a bear market now, which was good. Um, and my bear market strategies and sideways market volatility strategies uh, did a great job. So I doubled an account while uh, publishing my trading calls on my website five minutes before I entered, entered them. So, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, I'd call up my trades in my trading room. And I thought that was just a bunch of BS. A uh, bunch of charlatans out there that still exist in the market. You have to be very careful, um, as I know you know. Um, so I thought I was good. You know, if I was going to have a service, I was going to do it differently. So I would type in my trades, long or short. I always used a market order at the open because there's a lot of liquidity, and uh, I was typically a mean reversion trader. So I was fading the open, meaning I was buying a down gap or shorting an up gap. So I was going the opposite direction of the prevailing pre-open move, which meant I didn't have as much slippage as you might expect using a market order at the open. Anyhow, I was very transparent. I pre-established my targets and stops and I doubled an account in front of a large number of people. And that sort of locked in a bunch of clients, sort of for life, actually. I have a number of clients that have been with me uh, for 10 plus years, which uh, a lot of people can't say. Some of them came to me to um, expand the methodology of my gap trading um, beyond just the S&P futures. So um, long story short, I ended up actually taking um, quite a bit of financial capital from clients to invest in our technology and hire a team. 
several million actually over uh, a few years to build out a research infrastructure that would produce daily trading guides to guide my trading um, in other markets as well as our clients. So um, we changed the company's name to Investaquant uh, 2015 or so and um, continue to run that with a small team of unbelievable traders and researchers, a little quant team. Uh, so we continue to guide and advise other traders. Um, I had a, I've had enough success. I'm very, very fortunate. And I mean that. I'm not being humble. Um, there is some luck in all of this. As, as I mentioned, I had some luck making a little bit of money in my first year. Um, I've had luck along the way, but I've also made some good decisions, been around some good people. I've learned a lot from other traders, um, uh, had enough success that I actually started a, um, uh, managing capital. I started a CTA, Commodity Trading Advisor, Trading Futures and Commodities, mostly focused on index futures. Uh, did that for a couple of years, grew it to about 30 million in capital um, assets I was trading, which sounds like a lot. Um, ETM is really not in this world. Um, uh, it was a real pain in the butt <laughs> uh, being a so-called professional trader. Uh, all of your data fees, everything goes up, uh, the regulatory fees uh, and hurdles, NFA compliance, uh, huge distraction. Um, it's a tough business to grow assets until you get over 100 million. And, you know, I took a company public. I raised 150 million through an IPO and venture capital, actually almost 200 million total as a young guy. So I figured out how hard can it be to raise, you know, I did it when I was 30. Why can't I do it when I was 50? It was brutally hard. Um, it is way harder than people realize because smart money is, is smart for a reason, right? They're, um, they didn't get to having all that money without uh, making a few mistakes along the way. So it's very difficult to, everyone believed that I'd made money because I'd audited track records. I say, look, this is how I did, you know, five years in a row here, um, making these great returns. And, but they said, you know, it's, you manage your capital, which is really nothing. How do you know you can make money at scale when you manage other key people and you're running this business and the distraction? So um, they were more right than wrong. It was hard. I didn't lose a bunch of money. I just didn't make a bunch of money. So it was hard to scale. Um, it just became too much hassle. So I turned that in last summer. And today I just trade my own capital uh, while helping uh, others through my website, my business. So sort of best of both worlds. A lot, a lot more relaxing, uh, not necessarily easy, but these are great times to trade. So there's a long winded answer of my story. <laughs> That's a really interesting story. And I think we have a lot to discuss and talk about. So I want to go back in time to your first year of trading. So you said you made money in the first year and then lost a chunk of it afterward. How did you get back on track when you lost that money? What made you want to get back and keep trading again? Oh, good question. Um, so I remember uh, spending many, many nights lying in bed talking to my wife, um, who's my best friend, and um, she doesn't care about trading or anything in that regard. Uh, I'm sort of the nerd in the family, but she's uh, she helped me sort of recognize what my strengths and weaknesses were, and you know, to help me realize was I really potentially a very good trader, or had I just gotten lucky? And um, it was a little bit of both. Um, I'm this is a math game. I realized that I. I believed in myself and my ability to manage risk because um, I hadn't blown up or anything. I never took crazy risk. Um, and I just felt like I had the personality attributes. I've got a little um, OCD, to be honest. Uh, I can obsess. I can sit here for six hours and it'll feel like 30 minutes to me looking at numbers and data. I, I love, I love looking for patterns and a love understanding. Um, this is really not a, this part pattern recognition, but it's really more about understanding. Um, it's a game of understanding human emotions. So I like to, to think deeply about why markets do things. And I realize that um, trying to understand and connect the dots between fear and greed, right? That's what drives the markets. If you can translate those emotions into causes for market action, you can make that link it right, find a causative nature for a pattern, then you can, um, then you've got a chance of beating the market. So that premise was, I have a math background. I liked, I felt like I had a decent understanding through fire of how the markets work. Um, and I will, I'll be very frank. I, I had a, uh, probably a little bit more time and a little bit more money than most to stick with it. 
it, this is a very, very difficult game if you don't aren't well capitalized. I think that's what the, most traders don't realize. The vast majority of new traders fail because not because they're not disciplined. Some do. I, I really believe that the market in general, we do a good job as educators of, uh, of convincing folks that you have to be disciplined and so on. But because people simply aren't capitalized well enough. So they realize it. They get um, in a situation where they start risking more than they should for their capital that they have. Um, that's maybe where they lose their discipline. Uh, they execute their system flawlessly and they end up taking on more risk than they should. They end up probably trading out of ignorance also a little bit. They're disciplined, but they haven't really understood. They haven't done enough research understanding their edge to know when it works best and when they shouldn't be trading at all. I told my wife, we had a third child in 2005. So I had two toddlers, 2003, 2004, and they were like climbing in bed and with us and I wasn't sleeping well and you know, I'm trying to trade and I was so stressed out. And then, then we had the baby uh, in 2005. You know, like, honey, I said, I love you. I said, I'll, I'll help between dinner and going to bed, but um, I can't, I got to get some sleep at night. <laughs> so um, I literally locked myself. Uh, we have, uh, we had an extra room and I, I locked myself in that room. It was actually a third floor, sort of a man cave. And I said, I'm not coming down until I figured out my trading plan and how exactly what I'm, how I'm going to make money. So I spent, it took about three months of 12 to 18 hour days, seriously really just sort of locking myself away. I didn't go see friends. I didn't, I did very little, you know, to play with the kids and eat dinner and, and go back to work. It seemed like, um, but it allowed me to pour into the data, find patterns that made sense that, you know, I didn't in sample and out of sample classic back testing. And um, with the help of a friend that helped also, he was a professional developer and we built this portfolio of strategies. Uh, I wish I could tell you it was easier. Um, it was brutally hard for about a five year period. What would you tell someone who is not really clear about the idea of doing some research with this trading? What kind of data should they look for and how should they do the research if they're not sure about how to do it? So one of the big challenges in this industry is if you are not a, a developer, a coder, right? Uh, if you don't have those inclinations, you know, I, I was a nerd and they hardly had any software even existed when I was in high school, but I took a, um, a coding class at a local college in the 80s, believe it or not. Um, so I had an inclination, but I'm not a coder. You can probably tell from my personality, I'm a little bit of a weird bird. If you are a coder, then you should dig into some of the platforms like uh, TradeStation, where I went to learn easy language, uh, Ninjas, fantastic, Omni Broker. Um, they're all more than sufficient if you have coding skills. And there are some other good ones as well. Uh, those are just a few. Um, that I'm familiar with. Um, if you're not a coder, then you really need to link up with a developer, which is what I realized. I really wasn't good at coding. I'm sort of suck at it, frankly. Um, I'm good with the creative side of it. So I hired, like I said, my best friend or one of my best friends and a former developer to help me out. That's how I made it um, over the years. And I don't I'm certainly not trying to plug, but I will because I'm very passionate about what we do. Um, I got so frustrated with my own lack of software skills and inability to test simple ideas quickly and easily without having this cumbersome software from one of those brokers that I just mentioned. I won't call them out by name. Um, it was great. It changed my life, but I realized it didn't. It was just too frustrating and too slow. So I challenged um, my developer, and we have several developers, to build an internal backtesting tool where I could point and click to test simple ideas. I wanted to build test simple things like, okay, the markets, like today, we're got, we have a huge gap down in the markets. And we had a down day yesterday after nearly testing the highs. It intellectually made sense to me. Why can't I test what happens on a large down gap in the S&P um, the day before OPEX Friday, right? It's options expiration week. Maybe there's some pattern there that could be discovered or after we closed down X percent yesterday. So it's taken us a number of years, but we built an internal platform for me so I could test ideas and prototype them before I would send them to my development team to code them up and validate them before we then put them into action to trade. If you're trying, so you got to get data. I mean, that's just bottom line. You, if, if you think you can do this by just trading in every day and staring at the markets all day, you're not going to be successful. You can stare at the markets all day, but most of it should not be spent trading. You should be looking for patterns and analyzing the market and you can do it manually. I will tell you this, uh, one of the, my keys to success, and this is, it's not fun, but I printed out two years worth of five minute charts 
um, off of my charting application. And I went through and looked at what happened after the open for the rest of the day for two years on five minute charts. And I tested some, I sort of visually tested and applied some of the patterns I'd recognize when I used Excel, because I was using Excel and Yahoo Finance originally. So you can do that, create a pivot tables and all that. I found these patterns where it appeared that there was a mean reversion bias. And then I wanted to see them though, because just looking at a daily bar, when you test it, it doesn't tell you what happens in the path, right? The journey between the open and close is not disclosed. So I had to print out five minute charts and I marked them up and I still have them. My, my wife says they're a, a, a fire hazard. I probably have more than two years now of data because I don't do it anymore, but I did it for years. And I would go through and mark up my different strategies to see if they would have worked or not. And here's the magic of doing that is that I was able to visually see that, wow, my strategy, I had a mean reversion strategy. It worked 68 to 70% of most trading years. But I wanted to know how much adverse excursion did I need to take? And this is before I got my back testing strategy set up, of course. I'm going way back. But I was able to see that most of the strategies, or at least half of them, took adverse excursion. They went against my trade before they would roll over on a gap up and fill the gap. So it gave me confidence to do two things. One, I would it helped me identify, I need to put a little bit, put one contract on perhaps, or whatever the number is on the entry, and then scale in. If it went against me, I would actually add to my position, but I could tighten my, but I was able to see that I needed to give it room to work. And when, um, if it would rally into resistance and I'm trying to get short, I would add another contract or two. And then I would hold for the full gap fill, meaning for retracement back to the prior day's regular session close. So you can probably do this. I don't trade currencies, but just mimic the volume, right where the bulk of the volume is, uh, probably by the court, right, the country that has the currency, for example, target the prior day's closing action, the last accepted sort of known value. And I did that. So by st staring at those charts, I was able to really understand that I needed to be patient and I had realistic expectations that it wasn't going to go straight down. It wasn't going to be a winning trade right away. So um, you've got to find some mechanism. I'm giving you, just giving you some examples. Hire a developer, um, print out charts and, and, and track and put them in spreadsheets and do your own research manually like that. Um, we've got a tool you can check out, InvestorQuant, if you want. We call it Discover. It's all about edge discovery, testing things without coding. But you got to get, you know, what, what are some of the old um, addiction commercials that you see, right? Uh, whether you get help from us or not, it doesn't matter. Just get help somewhere. Well, it's the same thing for traders. Get research somewhere. You have to have real data or you're not going to be able to adapt. You're fooling yourself. Nothing works. What's one of the uh, one of my favorite sayings in trading is everything works some of the, some of the time. Nothing works all of the time. That is 100% true. So if you are a one hit wonder, if you have one strategy you lean on and you're, or your friend is telling you, you just got to do this every time it works all the time, he's ignorant or lying. Nothing works all the time. It's context, it's context that matters, right? Market conditions go uh, from raging bull and low vol markets to raging bear and high vol markets. You have to understand how your strategy works in different market regimes, as I like to call them, to have a chance of success. So you can only do that from being able to study your edges. I feel like a lot of people don't know when their strategy doesn't work also. They know when it works or they, they might spot when it works, but they don't know when it doesn't work, when to get out or when to stop trading that one and move to something else. Well, and as it relates to an individual trade, it's when you start, um, when it exceeds your predetermined accepted loss amount. So you, every trade needs to start with a max loss that you're willing to lose on a trade. If you don't know what that number is, stop trading. Please do yourself a favor. You're going to get crushed. Uh, you have to know your uncle point on a given trade. And then that applies to your portfolio, right? Your, your, your trading strategy. Maybe your, trading, your portfolio is one strategy now, but you have to know, have a max expected drawdown amount, right? How much are you, do you, how much are you willing to lose for a given strategy? That should equal, in my, amount, my opinion, um, some number bigger than the biggest historical loss that it is witnessed in back testing because your worst drawdown is in front of you, never behind you. And if you don't believe that, um, you will one day. It's going to be when you blow up your account, unfortunately. Tell me about that. So let's say you, you set that amount and, and then you go beyond that. How would you react then? Would you start trading it? Would you evaluate 
your strategy? Would you kind of look at all the trades? What we do in that case? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth here. I'm going to give you a real world example where I broke what I just said, but I'm going to explain why. So I created a second version of our portfolio of strategies that I was talking of these day trading strategies in 2013 or so. So I've been trading it for about five, six, seven years. Um, did a massive amount of research, sort of went back upstairs, locked myself in the room again, redid the strategies to improve them because um, the market's always a changing, right? So some things had worked better, some had worked worse. So I needed to tweak them. So I created this new portfolio of strategies. I identified the collective max drawdown that I should expect from the, that had ever happened in the back test. Um, I added a buffer to that. That was my line in the sand and I started trading. I was so confident in that strategy that I traded it on day one with, with live money, no out of sample. Now, granted, I've been doing this a while and I had a lot of experience, so you should never do that. But I'm just telling you, that's what I did. I traded with the one lot on all these strategies. And plus I learn more when I have some capital at risk. That's just my personality because simulators can give you some false information also, uh, depending upon the simulator. So um, as you would expect, I went immediately into drawdown. And in the first six months, it exceeded the worst drawdown since 1997. So I had 16 years worth of data. I'd never had a drawdown in a single year of um, the hypothetical back test that was as bad as I hit. I hit in my first six months. Anyone will tell you that you obviously overfitted your back test, curve fit. And I did do that in retrospect to a degree. Uh, though I had been doing it a while, I, I was very adept at what to look for, uh, but it's impossible not to overfit some. I paused my trading for about a month and evaluated everything. I went back and looked at the premises for each strategy to see if anything had really changed, what had, why hadn't it worked. And I really just determined that if you go back and look at your charts in 2013, where we're breaking out to new highs. So 2007 is when we, you know, we had highs in um, March of 2000. Then in 2007, 2008, we had a double top. And then the markets, we had the financial crisis. And then by 2013, we were putting in new highs. So we're making new highs in the equity markets. That was different than any period I had tested. So I, I was able to explain why the, my strategies may have start, not worked as well as I expected. So now I had a reason to still have hope. Um, and I started, um, I also record, realized that I had never, I was looking at the worst drawdown but I hadn't given it a full year. All of my original analysis was based upon the worst year in the past, but I'd only been trading it for six months. So I rationalized, I gave myself another buffer. I gave myself say another, I think it was 8%, something like that. Cause my number, my line in the sand was 20%. Um, and I'd gone to about 21% or so. I gave myself 9% to get to 30%. It was the most I was going to allow it to go down, but I also gave myself another six months. I was very lucky. Um, it came back, it came roaring back and it finished, uh, if I remember correctly, it finished up a little bit for the year, five or 6% for the year, came roaring back. You got to do those things very, very carefully. In general, it's not advised. Um, the only reason I gave myself enough wiggle room was because I had some experience doing it. But you have to have lines in the sand. You have to understand what's going on with your strategies and what's going on with the market. If you don't know and you're just hoping, hope's not a strategy, you're just going to blow up your account. Um, so that's how I think about it. So now I have um, uh, I have expected drawdowns for each strategy. I've expected drawdowns for my portfolio. Um, um, I track strategies now before they hit the drawdown levels. I use some statistical measures. Um, the simplest one that I use that I love is uh, a T-score, T-stat. Um, the different versions of it and Z-scores and whatever, just basic probabilities. It sounds complicated. Um, it's really not. It just looks at the, it's a simple way to measure a trade for um, its average expectancy, right? How much you make, the average trade, you need to know that on every strategy, what you expect to make on average over time, right? Your collective wins and probability of winning minus your collective losses and probability of losses, come up with your average trade. Um, and you take your average trade, you look at the square root of the sample size, how many trades you're looking back in history, and simply divide by the standard deviation of your trades. How much on average does it vary up or down? And I don't know if you're not a statistician, this makes your eyes 
go over, but the concept just simply looks at those three factors. And when your number starts falling apart, you, it's indicative that you may have overfit and found or found noise in the markets. So you don't have a real edge. A real strong strategy over time not only will have a strong t-test. Um, if you don't have t-test, so it's too complicated. You can use profit factor and some, some other basic statistics. Um, but it should hold up in your back test and your out of sample trading as well to some degree. Interesting. That, that's something I think every trader should make first and just some like general due diligence as well of things to do before you go with the system. Yeah, you don't have to have complicated statistics. That's, statistics are not my key. To, I'm not a statistician. Um, I love stats. Um, I love math. But um, everything I do, you could do with seventh grade math, probably maybe eighth grade math. It's not much more complicated than that. Tell me about raising money for trading or like for fun. How does that work? What would be the basics? You say you didn't really like it, but what would be the basic for someone who want to go that path of raising capital to trade? Well, first, take your idea. And, and so in, here in the States, there's something called the CTA Expo. Um, I don't know if they work with Forex traders or not. Um, but it's a great way to meet people, whether regardless of what you're trading. It's called the um, CT Expo. It's a couple um, wealthy individuals uh, uh, that have been successful, and they have a massive network of investors that will invest in early stage strategies and, and early managers, emerging managers. So I went up there before I was a CTA just to see what I was getting myself into. I met managers, showed them my results, told them what my strategy how it was constructed and my expectations. And I was able to identify there was a fair amount of interest in what I was doing because it was day trading, no overnight risk, takes advantage of volatility environments, and I had a proven track record. They convinced me uh, that if I became a CTA, then uh, they would allocate capital to me. So I knew that for the time and effort of getting registered and taking my series three uh, um, tests, and, and, and um, the legal things, you, and the, you have to go to the FBI and get, literally, you have to go get fingerprinted. So I had to go to the FBI department like I was some bad guy and get fingerprinted. And uh, it, it's quite an evolved process. It's, you really, really got to want to do it. So once uh, I got registered uh, with the NFA, uh, you can go to the NFA website to find this information uh, as well. There's lots of resources I uh, had people lined up as soon as um, we were registered. I say we because my original developer has stayed with me uh, for all these years. Um, and he's he was a co-founder of InvestorQuant and then with our um, trading capital firm called um, Numeri. We started um, entered, uh, going to these different conferences, the three CTA Expo conferences a year, or at least there were, were Chicago, Miami, in New York, I started meeting allocators, people that had money and sharing our results. We started attracting capital. People would give us capital and you can have different requirement amounts, um, but generally 100,000 and up is as low as you want to go. Um, and generally the bigger, the better. So you can drive bigger, you know, the smaller the amount you take, the more clients you have to have to reach some critical mass. So um, I did that circuit for a couple of years. There's a couple of huge uh, conferences um, called Context is one of them. Um, one of the other ones, Managed Futures Association down, uh, both of them in Miami in January, February. A lot of money from around the world goes to them. And you sit there and, and have back to back to back 30 minute sessions all day. I had 15 to 20 sessions a day for uh, two or three days sitting with people that had capital. And uh, some of them say yes, many say no. Many of them were intrigued. They said, wait till you get to 100 million or some critical mass. So that's the problem is a, um, if you're raising capital, it's really hard to get to a critical mass. Um, and I don't want to discourage anyone from chasing the dreams. I'm a big believer that if I had listened to anyone uh, that, <laughs> that I respected uh, about the crazy ideas I had, whether it's going into the army and flying helicopters or um, taking starting a technology company with no money, just credit cards when I was a young man in my 20s, um, and had no chance of success, but pulled it off somehow and took the company public. Um, if I'd listened to anyone, I wouldn't be here today. So you've got to follow your dreams, but you want to do it with your eyes wide open, right? So what people need to understand is that smart money is your friends and family will give you money, but smart money will only give you money if they don't have to pay you in general, a management fee. So they want to be completely performance-based 
uh, allocations, meaning my typical deal that I would sign that I would get with from investors or allocators, as they're called, is they would say, OK, Scott, we will not pay you a management fee. So zero percent management fee, but we'll pay you 25 percent of the profits. You get to keep 25 percent of your profits. You know, you do the math on it and that, that sounds great. You look at your track record like, man, this is going to be a layup. It wasn't. <laughs> um, you, you, um, I, at first, I had a little bit of bad luck. I went into a drawdown uh, as soon as I, pretty soon after, not as soon. I ran up the first half of the year, attracted a ton of interest. I was up, say, 40% on cash um, in the first five or six months. Um, and then I went into a drawdown um, on cash um, after I got the money on board. So everyone went straight into a drawdown. So my account was up. Everyone that came in after they saw what I was doing, when it was now in a drawdown. So not only was I not getting a management fee, but you can only make money when you hit new equity highs for the clients. So you have to recover the returns, which is only fair uh, for the investor. And then you get your percentage of profits once you get to what's called the high watermark. So um, I was in the hole, plus my algorithms. We do all of this systematically now. Um, the, this is a great tip, by the way. Um, I call it my speed bump analogy, but this is for managing risk. We do it systematically now. Um, when you get in a drawdown, you need to take your foot off the gas. Okay, so the deeper you get into a drawdown, you know, the more your account is suffering, right? As you're losing capital, the less aggressive you should trade. So you take your foot off the gas. Um, so we deleveraged as I got into this drawdown in the uh, late 2018, where I was only trading about 25% of my typical daily risk. So the analogy, a couple of crude analogies. One is uh, we were eating like mice after shitting like an elephant. <laughs> so it was a, a, a not a good way to go. The other analogy, which is less crude, is digging a hole, a large hole with a big shovel, but trying to dig my way out with a small shovel. That was the problem when you deleverage too much. But we had to do it because I had a, a line in the sand that I told investors I'll never lose more than seven and a half percent. Futures, it gets, you know, it's easy with leverage, you can sort of return on cash is different than return on trading level. So my my portfolio never lost. Uh, more than roughly seven and a half percent. That was my line, and right, I went right to seven and a half percent. So to keep from doing that, I had to deleverage. We've traded our way out of that, but it's just taken too long. So uh, I shut it down. Uh, we shut it down uh, this past summer because we were still underwater for most of our clients. Though we made it back, so it's just too hard, too much regulatory risk. There's easier ways to make money. I'm trying to squash anyone's dreams, but go into it with eyes wide open. So in that analogy of taking your foot off the gas, when would you go back to normal size? Would it be when you hit past high or would it be before that? Oh, yep. So we um, we simply tiered it. So um, the, some simple rules for traders, whether you're discretionary or systematic, um, have different flavors of it, but the concept is what matters. So if you get to uh, pretty much leave it alone until you get to X percentage of your max allowed drawdown. So and typically I give it up to half of my max drawdown and just let it trade. So I don't do anything as I'm losing capital, but that can be a big number. So you got to be careful. But once I go over the 50% threshold, then I reduce uh, by say 25%. And I've had different variations for different portfolios. So this is just a hypothetical example. Reduce by 25%. If I get to 75% of the way towards my max allowed drawdown, drop it down even further. So you can do it at different thresholds as you go down. And then as you come back up, you just reverse it. So once you're no longer within 75% of your max allowed drawdown, increase your allocation by another 25%. So, and then once you get within half of your max allowed drawdown, you know, add another 25 to 50%. What would you see you've gained in managing capital other than just the money? Have you learned anything useful while managing capital or is there something more skills you've gained or was it just the same as trading your own capital? Great question. You have good questions. Well, learned learned a lot. The I learned the biggest weakness uh, that I had was right. There's three elements, three levers or levers that impact trading performance. One is the strategy itself. There's, then there's execution. Right, you can have a great strategy poorly executed, screws up your results. And the third one is your risk management for not just the strategy. It's, it's got to be a portfolio of strategies. Right, if, if you're not trading a portfolio, it can be meaning more than one, two, three, four, five to some number, I have 
probably too many, but I, I, um, I'm a big believer in diversification. What I learned was I was really good at, my strategies were really strong, which I already knew. My execution was really strong, which I already knew. What I didn't really anticipate was that I had uh, my portfolio had never been really tested at scale of all the strategies. Some of the strategies I had less experience with. So the key and in, in the complexity was I had not nearly as much experience managing the portfolio's risk. So my model that worked well for me as I just described was scaling down risk and then scaling up did not work as well for managing capital, other people's capital, because I got into the hole I just said. I couldn't get out. I was fine with my own capital doing that, but I couldn't make money playing the game with my portfolio rules. So if I had to do it over again, I would use different portfolio management rules because ultimately you're doing it to make returns. And I would have, I would have slowed my drawdowns more and um, not given it as much room on, in that regard. Interesting. So are there any topics or anything we didn't talk about that you'd like to mention or explain to people? Any other concept that you think is interesting for people to learn? Well, I'll just give some tips if I can, just because I know I've been a little bit long-winded. I'm passionate about this. I love what, what I do. Start small. Every trader needs to start small um, and build a track record. The biggest mistake is people just have unrealistic expectations and they try to make more than is realistic in, in a reasonable amount of time. So make your mistakes when you're small and spend what I call um, the 90-10 rule. 90% of every trader's time and effort ought to be spent studying, researching, observing, not trading. It's to the degree that you're opposite of that, right? If you're 90-10 trading and 10% research, it's exponential risk for you as a trader is my belief. You are not gonna get smarter doing the same thing over and over that's causing you to lose money. Um, repetition can actually cause your risk of ruin to, to go up. Discipline can cause your risk of ruin to go up. Uh, you need to spend more time studying, more time researching, more time adapting to changing market conditions and, and preparing than trading. So that's why I'm here is because I've spent, um, there's a, an, another concept that people should be aware of. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, have you ever heard of him by chance? Yes, yes, of course. He, he's written some fantastic books on, um, he's all about probabilities and statistics. I don't remember which book it was, but he has something he calls the 10,000 hour rule. Every expert in every field is the one common trade they spent at least 10,000 hours mastering it, whether they're where the, whether it was Beethoven or Bill Gates with Microsoft or a trader, it can be, or a hockey player like my neighbor, um, 10,000 hours mastering that craft. That's not 10,000 hours trading that you need. You need 10,000 hours of mostly research and time studying and evaluating the markets, less time spent trading. So, um, that takes years. Um, and until then, you're not going to get consistent success. Um, more than likely, if you do, you might be a little bit of random good luck. So be careful. It's easy to be fooled by um, randomness of the markets. And remember, everything works some of the time. So you've got to figure out when is it good, random good luck and when is it you just happen to be trading the right strategy in the right market and it's about to fall apart. That's good advice. What can people find you don't connect with you or reach out after the interview? What can they see your, your, pro, your programs and things you offer? Yeah, um, check us out uh, at investaquant.com. Uh, That's spelled, I don't know if you can share the link or not, but it's I-N-V-E-S-T-I-Q-U-A-N-T. We are we provide statistical edges for uh, active uh, traders of futures and equities. We don't have Forex uh, yet. We have a lot of uh, requests for that. And you can shoot me an email at scott, S-C-O-T-T, at investaquant.com. We also have a Twitter you can follow. we got a great team. Uh, we're passionate about helping traders, so uh, check us out. And if not, uh, good luck to everyone. We'll put a link in the description of the video or in the show notes for the podcast for sure. If people want to connect with you or it's what you're doing there, that, that's for sure. Because I think it's a good thing. So Sure. Thank you. And so I'd like to ask my guests one question at the end of the podcast, which is if you could give people one piece of advice on how they can become better traders, what would that one piece of advice be? Well, I think I've already covered it. Uh, spend a whole lot more time studying researching, preparing, and uh, lower your expectations. I can't give one piece of advice. ET, I've been doing this for 15 years. <laughs> I think I've said enough. Research, start small, be conservative. Um, the way to make the most money over the long term is to stay in the game over the long term. This is not a get rich quick thing. Uh, most of your clients, I'm guessing, are new and younger. You've got, a, you've got the rest of your life to make money. The cool thing is I can do this if I, if I were in a wheelchair. As long as my brain works halfway, I expect to trade 
hopefully to the day I die. So, and I hope I've got another 40, 50 years in me. Um, so think of it in that regard. And right, the, the, one of the natural wonders of the world, right, is not the natural wonder, but one of the, in the same concept in the financial markets is the power of compound interest, right? It's the most valuable thing ever. Um, so compounding your returns over time is the name of the game. So just survive, take one, two, three, four, five years, take a long-term view of your career then you can set yourself up for a lifetime of success and returns and compounding and controlling your own destiny and pursuing your dreams. That's a good reminder, very good reminder. Thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate it for your time. And it's been uh, really good to hear your advice for my listeners and people will chat to you and connect with you for sure. Sounds good. Good luck to you. Take care.